Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It is wonderful to see you all here. My name is Leah Frieden, and I'm a reference librarian at the Fayetteville Public Library. And before we begin, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our sponsors. This event is made possible by the University of Arkansas MFA program in creative writing and translation, the J. William Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, the Walton Family Foundation, the Fayetteville Public Library, and the James E. and Ellen Wadley Roper Professorship in Creative Writing. So thank you all. And um, with that, I'd like to turn things over to Andrea Rogers. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Waddle. Well um, OCO, I'm honored to introduce writer Brandon Hobson. Dr. Hobson is a fellow Cherokee citizen. His last novel, Where the Dead Sit Talking, was shortlisted for the National Book Award. It was a winner of the Reading the West Book Award and longlisted for the International Dublin Literary Award. His new book, The Removed, was released earlier this month. As a reader, I love work that leads me to consider new stories, new ideas, and new possibilities. Brandon's novel, Where the Dead Sit Talking, asks us to consider the story of Sequoia, a 15-year-old boy in foster care. Consider the idea that laws that are applied unevenly to black and indigenous people of color that break up families by imprisoning parents rather than providing resources for people living with alcoholism, addiction, or mental illness are ineffective at best and fatal at worst. Sequoia's story asks us to pay attention to the long lasting effects of trauma on a child who may or may not become adult, an adult and imagine new possibilities for our most vulnerable human beings. Brandon's new novel, The Removed, focuses on a family that survived the racist murder of 15-year-old Ray Ray. Um, from the publisher, the removed begins with the family's annual bonfire approaching, an occasion marking both the Cherokee national holiday and Ray Ray's death, a rare moment in which the family openly talks about his memory. The family matriarch, Maria, attempts to call the family together from their physical and emotional distances. But as the bonfire draws near, each of them feels a strange blurring of the boundary between normal life and the spirit world. Maria and Ernest take in a foster child who seems to almost miraculously keep Ernest's mental fog at bay. Sonia becomes dangerously fixated on a man named Vin. And in the wake of a suicide attempt, Edgar finds himself in the mysterious darkening land, a place between the living and the dead where old atrocities echo. Hobson's novel, The Removed, asks us to consider our stories of the past. Perhaps the racist and greedy realities that brought us historical trauma have not disappeared. Through the point of view of members of the Achota family, we're asked to consider what is it like to lose a child to violence, enabled and excused by the law, to consider how a family goes on when there's no justice, to consider all the flawed human ways we deal with trauma when there's no humanity. The Removed asks us to remember our stories, remember that our ancestors got us here, that in our case, Cherokee people walked a thousand miles to build a new nation. After reading The Removed, could we consider the possibility that there's no real past, only a present where the spiritual and the contemporary coexist? Could we imagine ways we might heal that will bring us closer to our ancestors? And might we be better off when we welcome our ancestors into the world to walk with us and teach us? The first time I heard Brandon read, I was struck by the compassion in his voice for Sequoia. Brandon Hobson's work reminds us to consider other people with compassion. And that's something I love about his stories. Brandon's other books include the short novels Deep Ellum and Desolation of Avenues Untold. His fiction has won a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in such journals as McSweeney's, Quarterly, Conjunctions, American Short Fiction, Noon, and many other places. Dr. Hobson is currently an assistant professor of creative writing at New Mexico State University, and he also teaches in the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Andrea, for, um, for that nice introduction. Uh, thanks also to the University of uh, Arkansas um, and to the library and, and uh, the MFA program there, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I forgot to ask how long you want me to read. Um, is there a, a time limit or that you would like me to um, to, to, to read for, or um, I know Tony and I will uh, 
be in discussion, but uh, <clears throat> I can just read and, and um, we'll good. see. It's only okay. no time limit from my point of view. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, yeah. So, uh, so in the removed, um, I think I'm going to read uh, a section. There's a section from one of the family member, uh, one of the family members names uh, Edgar, and um, um, I'm going to read um, a part where he. Um, to give you a little uh, background, uh, Edgar ends up in this place called the, 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 the Darkening Land, and it's kind of a mythological um, space, and it's told, it's mentioned in some of the old traditional uh, Cherokee stories, um, and uh, so I, I placed him in, in this Darkening Land, and uh, uh, he becomes the object of a... Uh, uh, a real life shooting video game that's being developed um, by someone named Jackson Andrews and uh, some other people. And so I'm gonna um, read a little bit there and I'll read a little bit, I'll read from the, uh, the game manual um, as well. The projector began clicking and a moment later, a robotic voice spoke. I am an Indian, the computerized voice said. Shoot the Indians. The light on the device blinked, and I saw a blue light project from it. In front of us, a cloud was forming into something human-shaped. The image that slowly appeared in front of us was not Jim Thorpe, but a hologram of an Indian man in full headdress with feathers standing before us. I stood up. He was maybe six feet tall with his arms at his sides. His body was in focus, but his face remained a little bit blurry. There was a cool tint to his body as if he were standing under a blue light bulb. I lost all awareness of my surroundings, if only for a moment lost my interest in the image and the technology and in Jackson, consumed as I was by the reflection of blue light. But the moment reasserted itself and almost immediately I felt the absurdity in the situation. That's not Jim Thorpe. Fuggin' glitch, he said. Must be a damn glitch in the software. I need to get in there and screw with it. Glitch, it's a man in a headdress. I watched the image of the man flicker while Jackson, still up on the ladder, looked inside the machine. He picked up a tiny microphone and spoke into it. Testing, testing, he said. Slowly, the apparition began approaching us. He didn't so much walk as he glided slowly toward me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. When he reached to me, I could hear a ticking sound coming from his head. The expression on his face was horrific, a cry for help. Testing, Jackson said into the tiny mic again. The apparition said, I am the savage, shoot the savage. Then it froze, staring out into the distance. I realized it had paused, fallen into sleep mode, unresponsive and still. Shit, 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 Jackson said. He had the projectors lit open and was leaned way over, trying to rewire or repair whatever was wrong with it. Give me a minute, he said. Is it still the, is it still the same image? What the fuck is going on, I said. Trying to get the Jim Thorpe image to appear. This was a model, a stock image, shouldn't be there. Please ignore. I watched him bite his lip, concentrating. The image of the unblinking native man kept flickering in front of me eyes wide open. Finally, Jackson clicked it off and the image disappeared. The thing's gone apeshit, Jackson said, wobbling as he climbed down the ladder. He slumped down in the chair. Voice activation is hard. There are speech patterns, fucking glitch. This isn't for the sports game, I said. It wasn't Jim Thorpe, what's going on? Shit, tell me the truth, Jackson. He stared into the floor, drunk. Seems like this is different. 
a different game about Indians, I said. Is this what you were filming me for? Jackson didn't say anything. He wouldn't look at me. What's going on, I said. I didn't want you to know. Why not? It's nothing, just a harmless game. I don't even want to talk about it. Let's head back upstairs. I need to get to bed. Jackson stumbled a little and steadied himself as he trudged slowly up the stairs, not seeming to care that I wasn't following him. I stood for a moment, reeling from what I had just seen. Then not really knowing what I was looking for, I started going through Jackson's belongings to see what I could find. I opened the cabinets. There were papers, receipts, notes with scribblings. I shuffled through them. I, I wasn't sure what I was looking for. Next to the ladder, I found the game manual. Savage, ready for beta test immediately. Player goals. Determine whether the savage Indians are real or holograms by interaction. Capture and torture, shoot to kill. Specifics, single or multiplayer, first person shooter, ages 10 and up. Players may purchase game weapons from local dealers in DL, DT's Gun Supply, Conway's House of Guns and Ammo, Guns R Us, etc. Please register code tracking number for game. Location, Darkening Land City Limits is approximately 1,970 feet below sea level. Game objective, players take on the role of police officers, special agents, soldiers, or assassins who are fighting a local threat of a savage SAV invasion. Weapons can be mounted on steady surfaces for shooting, but fewer points are collected. Players shoot savages. Red helmet bonus. Players earn red helmets for information gained from SAV. In order to reach the reward tier, player must earn 10 red helmets. Red helmets can be traded in for experience points. Torture bonus. Players can place SAV in the torturous radioactive mud pit TRMP, located approximately 69 kilometers south of Devil's Bridge, where they can question SAV and gain information and points before destroying SAV by slow radioactive torture in the mud pit. The radioactive mud creates a slow memory loss based on historical records of deaths near Devil's Bridge. Therefore, the, man, the, the more torture a a player uses, the less information is gained. TRMP is the worst of possible tortures for SAV and is used as a strategic gameplay for long-term players because it earns them red helmets. Reward tier. Experience points are saved in system to encourage long-term gameplay and can be redeemed for a missile launcher fighter, MLF or Petroleum Fuel Freeway Fighter, PFFF, in case of a rare SAV escapes from TRMP. Note, PFFF redeemers, be aware that PFFF slash MLF trades are not accepted because MLFs are in much higher demand and take more experience points to redeem. Once a player collects three different MLFs, player then has opportunity to enter the jewel zone. Jay-Z, and purchase native jewelry stolen from SAVs suffering in TRMP. Community rules. Never share personal information with other players or SAVs, even when SAVs are in TRMP, unless you're redeeming red helmets for PFFFs or MLFs through Andrews Jackson Media Incorporated. Cheating, impersonators, and trollers, C T R M P. We at Andrews Jackson Media want you to be careful and have fun. And I'm going to read one more, just two-page section. Um, this this section is from Chala, who is a spirit ancestor. 
and he's speaking to his son. Beloved, the earth will always speak to us when we need to hear her the most. Even in my time, we were worried about rising oceans and burning land. I always looked for warnings. Our family believes strongly in Tecumseh's warning of the soldiers coming to remove us from our land. There was drought. There were high winds and a bitter, bitter cold winter. You are aware that this was a terrifying time for us. We were frightened, but ready to defend our home. Our people were, would refuse to leave, even though we were tricked by the government with their fraudulent treaty. We did not trust them. It was raining the night we rounded up a few families and quietly snuck away to hide in a cave in the mountains. I told the other people in the Cherokee language, what we will do will affect our people for years to come. I thought of all my visions, our visions, the prophecy of the coming migration and hoped they would be proven false. That night in the cave, one of the wives was so afraid for her new baby that she ran out into the rain with a tomahawk yelling, kill, kill. She felt the presence of a spirit's strength so powerfully that she threw the tomahawk into the night sky in the rain and it never came down again, was never found anywhere. That night, it hailed large ice pellets. We were there 10 nights before they arrived to destroy our homes. We watched from afar as the ones who swarmed on our land like a pack of wolves began firing their weapons. Now there was a great threat upon us. The soldiers were ordered to be civil but they destroyed our cabins and barns. They slaughtered our chickens and hogs and cattle. They prodded our wives and elders with bayonets as they forced them out of their homes and to stockades. By the end, many of our people had nothing but their clothes. Everything else was gone. We felt a great misery spread throughout our land. Soldiers dug into graves to steal the gold from our dead never bothered by the stench of corpses that filled the air. Though we were safe in seclusion, two other men and I couldn't stand that we were not helping our people. So we set out armed with our weapons. And you, my brave son, you came with us. At once the soldiers saw us approaching and soon they surrounded us. We attacked and fought, but there were too many of them. One of them hit you with a shovel and I lunged at him with my knife, cutting his arm. The other soldiers pulled me off and held me down. They tied us with rope. I told them to kill me first, but they did not agree. I closed my eyes and lowered my head as they pointed their rifles at us. I begged you not to open your eyes, even when they told you to. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Brandon. We just finished reading it and talked about it yesterday in my graduate class here. And so it was really, really great to have you read from the novel um, since we just finished talking about it. I do have questions related to the ending, but I know certainly not everyone <laughs> has read it already. So I will keep those to myself for later and instead um, ask questions that will not provide spoilers, right? I think that seems like a better idea. Um, I'm wondering how I, I really was drawn to the section of the novel that you read from first um, about gaming and the notion that, that there's trickery involved in the game. At first, it's supposed to be a Jim Thorpe game and then it ends up being Savage instead. I'm wondering if you could talk a little about the inspiration for including those games in the novel um, and a little bit about how you decided, you know, where to include them in the novel and why. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks for that question, Tony. Um, those sections of Edgar's are the, the most absurd, I think, of the novel. It's a very serious novel, right? But then Edgar's sections um, are a little bit veer into um, a little bit sort of, you know, the 
black comedy of the 60s and set the black humorous and absurdism. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted to, in, in a way, make the darkening land, which is this mythical place, not too different from the world that we live in. And I knew that I wanted to talk about the violence against natives um, now and, uh, and 200 years ago. Um, and so thinking about this section with the game, I thought, well, you, you know, that, that allowed me to sort of think about how, um, you know, how ridiculous um, it is, right? Just the, how absurd that um, shooting people, right, for no, which we're seeing more and more happen. And I'm thinking of the police violence uh, I guess it helps a little bit that I, you know, was thinking about Dennis Banks and uh, Russell Means and a lot um, about the American Indian movement um, in the 60s and 70s and how that really all formed out of uh, police violence against natives. And, um, uh, you know, so, um, and that that seems to still be around. And um, so I wanted to, for Edgar's, because, it, it exists in this fictionalized mythical darkening land. It allowed me to be as absurd as I wanted to be. But, but I, I knew I wanted to, um, you know, to incorporate something modern um, with, with the, the, you know, the modern violence with the old violence that it's just to try to parallel the two, right? It's still around. Um, it's not. <clears throat> it's not going anywhere. It seems to. It seems to be. So. Um, so I really, uh, you know, um, pushed that idea in terms of um, gaming too, and thinking about, um, you know, how easy it is to get guns. And I know Tony that you write a lot or have written in your last book, of course, which is, uh, which is a fantastic i've told you that you know that your book of essays about guns and so that the whole sort of gun culture and and um you know also that edgar is afraid that he's going to die in the same way that his brother died by shooting so that is a large that i try to extend that fear throughout all of edgar's sections is is he going to end up dead in the same way that his brother was yeah i think that you really do draw that through really clearly um, in the novel. And two, having Jackson be Jackson Andrews and having the company be named after him is a really, of course, nice touch in case people were missing the history there. I think, yeah, absolutely. Then the history comes through. So um, well, I, I quite like that reference. Well, thank you. And I also, um, I, I, I felt like I was a little bit of a trickster also in with, uh, with Edgar's sections. Right, and, and incorporating little clues, um, you know, with names and, and those kind of things, um, you know, and, and certainly in that, um, uh, with, the, with the manual, the game manual, you know, um, with uh, playfulness um, uh, in terms of the acronyms and, and uh, you know, uh, so there, there's some trickery going on in Edgar's sections. Yeah, it's really fun. It's fun and I think it does add that lightness. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I wondered too, if you could talk a little bit since we're talking about the, the past being pulled into the present through violence, we also have in the novel throughout the past and more um, spiritual historical kinds of stories, right? Um, cultural stories being drawn into the present too with chalice sections. Um, and then the interweaving of chalice sections into the present toward the end of the novel, which I won't say too much about as to avoid spoilers, but I wondered if you could talk about how, like, why you decided to include um, Chala's voice and how you decided to mix those stories in with present day stories. Yeah, and that's, you know, a lot of it is, um, came out of my reading of the old um, Cherokee stories that uh, you know, and Andrea knows this, but, you know, they, they came to Oklahoma, um, you know, by, 
uh, orally and were written down by a man named uh, James Mooney, who wrote them down, you know, over a hundred years ago and collected all these after, you know, talking and, and collected all these stories that, you know, in, in, in their own way, um, um, you know, you, 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 you hear and read different versions of them, right? They're all sort of changing. But I wanted those, at least some of those stories, which I didn't even, you know, get. I mean, there's just a few in this book. But part of it is for them to, to exist, to continue to exist, right, in contemporary uh, fiction. And so I, I wanted to include those and somehow um, balance the old with the current, right? So Chala, I, I wanted... I wanted to write from an ancestral voice because I was thinking about ancestral trauma and intergenerational trauma and how that continues for 200 years to affect this, the Achota family, right? And so th that, that decision early on, I knew early on, I wanted to have a voice from 200 years ago. I thought about having you know, a, a jump back at flashback and scenes and an actual, right? But the more I started writing it and thinking about it, the more I realized that these were sort of epistolary sections that felt like Chala is speaking these to his son because they were killed together by the soldiers. So I wanted him, you know, in, in a sort of familial way to narrate what happened to his son that's, um, that was killed along with him. So, you know, it's um it's kind of an experimental way. I the other thing too is I always I always want I want to be the type of writer who does who tries different things, you know, and experiments. And and I want this novel to be unlike any other novel before. And and I mean I would encourage any writer to, to try to write your own novel, right? That um, in your own way. Um, but, but that's, that's part of it too, was thinking, you know, here, I'm going to add another voice to it. Um, and, and so I decided to have it just be this, uh, ancestral voice. Yeah, this novel really is stylistically quite different from where the dead set talking. I mean, I suppose content wise there, there are boys who are in foster care in both. But even content, how you deal with content and stylistically, they're very different. So that's good advice, young writers in the audience to try, just yeah. try to strive for something new. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you come to that territory and why it's important for you to include um, those who are involved in some of these structures and systems like interactions with the police or um, interactions with foster care system? Um, why why that seems to be a recurring pattern so far in your work? Well, um, really, it's only been it's been a recurring pattern in the last two the last two books, only because I've really been um, you know shaken about it for the past oh since about 2015 or 2016. Um, I, I where I've really been bothered by it. Uh, and that just comes from reading, um, you know, and, and really thinking about it a lot. Um, and, you know, to, to, though, to go back, I mean, um, I, again, I'm, I, I, I feel like there's not a whole lot of coverage, first of all. There's not enough coverage about Native issues, national coverage about Native issues. Teenagers get shot, um, have gotten shot and have died, which started the Native Lives Movement a few years ago. Uh, and, and it's not getting quite the, the, the national coverage, right, that, that I wish it would. Um, and, and that um, goes back to, you know, the natives, let me open it up to, to media, right, that um, television shows, if my two sons want a, um, uh, an, a native boy, on TV to look up to what show are they going to watch that has a native boy or a native girl to look up to um, what TV show and all the apps and all the channels that we have, which are too many for me to count. Um, 
I can't find one television show. Um, there's a new movie out starring Tom Hanks, uh, but he kind of plays the white savior, right? And the Kiowa are portrayed as uh, not not urban and not sort of right. I mean, that the Hollywood to me seems to this is my big problem with them, and that I hope changes. Hollywood is not portraying natives as regular people. They're not interested. They're they're only interested in showing the sort of wild 1800s, and that that bothers me a lot. And I think, I mean, it's for 50 years, they've, they've been able to do something about it. The 1973, when Marlon Brando, right, um, refused the Oscar for best actor for The Godfather and Sachin Littlefeather went up there and everybody booed, um, probably booed him, not her, you know, but, but still they could have done something and they haven't done something yet. Um, this is a sort of, I, I apologize for ranting over this, you know, but it's, um, I've been thinking a lot about it just recently. And I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that it will change. What else? But, but all that, you know, it was what I was thinking about when I was writing this book also. And, um, you know, why is there not, um, what, why is there, why, why are there not better television and, and movies out there for, for our kids? To see, I mean, you know, like the Cosby Show in the '80s was was showing, you know, this, this family, and and why is it their family now in 2021 um, that shows native, um, you know? So, uh, the, uh, um, the, those issues uh, when I was writing um, the Removed uh, all fall into nothing's changed, you know. Violence has not changed. Um, and uh, so, so that, that, you know, that was a big part of it. Nothing in the national media. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it will though. I'm hoping we're right on the, the cusp of something happening here, you know. That's a long-winded uh, rant rather than, I don't know that I answered the question, but, um, you know, it, Russell Means and Dennis Banks were, were two founders of the American Indian Movement who came out of this, right? This exact, the way they were actually seeing, you know, in the streets in Min Minneapolis. I read, I read, uh, um, Dennis Banks's uh, autobiography, which I believe is called Ojibwe Warrior, a while, you know, some time back, and, you know, talking about the violence that he was witnessing um, in Minneapolis at that time, and, and that, that movement, you know, really spread to, uh, you know, of course, Alcatraz, and they, then they went to Washington, D.C., and then they, um, you know, uh, Wounded Knee, and, and um, uh, but, but it all came out of, I think, this sort of frustration, you know, that we, that I think a lot of natives are, um, I mean, on Twitter, Lucas Brown Eyes is always, uh, he's, he's somebody to follow on Twitter because he's a, he's a uh, Los Angeles native writer. He's trying to, you know, he, he's really trying to get stuff done. And it's, um, I don't know if I can be a part of that, but I'm trying, you know, uh, and, and we as artists, and I'll say that, you know that that term of artists as, as in our writing um this is this is what we can you know one of the things that we can do is, is have conversations about about it yeah no i agree with that very much i think for those of us who know that the american indian movement started in minneapolis it's and then after what happened to george floyd it's very hard not to connect that in a direct line sort of way because the American Indian movement, of course, came out of the police violence that was happening at, back then in Minneapolis. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think, um, and then what you're saying too about film, it's not for lack of native and indigenous filmmakers, right? And, and TV writers who are available. Um, I could name 10 or 20 probably, right? You probably could too. And so it's just, they're not being given the mainstream opportunities. And that was true maybe 10, 15 years ago also in literature and books are catching up. So my hope is too that the film will catch up. So I hear you on those things for sure. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I know that you teach and you're a parent, as you mentioned, and you're a writer, um, prolific writer. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about working, not just writing, but working on a complex, you know, structurally complex, lots of narrators, lots of time periods, um, kind of novel while balancing your other responsibilities. If you could talk a little bit about writer's life or writer's practice, I think that might be helpful for some of the people in the audience. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all have 24 hours in a day <clears throat> that would choose, we choose to, right, to do whatever with those 24 hours. Obviously, I have to sleep. I think finding a window of time where you can, you can work. I think the good thing about an MFA program, the great thing about an MFA program is that you have, you should have time, right, to allow yourself to write and, and, and really take advantage of, of that. That's a, you know, that's, um, that's, that's really a special time to develop. And, and work and um, um, you know I, I think as long as you're productive because I could sit at the computer probably I could sit for three hours and and not do much right <laughs> I mean we all have those you know sort of blocked moments right that um, nothing much happens I try to and my old teacher Stuart Onan always said this um, shoot for this this doesn't sound like much but shoot for one page a day if you can one page in a day that's that's absolutely very doable right um and one page uh and that's not even working seven days a week let's just say you know you got five pages out of the week which i think is doable and within six months you'll have a really really good chunk of something if it's a novel um you know you'll you'll uh but that that goal is doable if i think well i almost got a page today i wrote three quarters of a page today that's that's good enough and then i'm not sort of beating myself up for not getting anything done and then there are, there are those days where you know this counts too you're revising and you're rewriting which we all do um you know, and I started something, uh, you know, um, not long ago uh, and wrote about, you know, uh, well, over break, I had like 15 pages, 10 or 15 pages. And then I knew I just needed to start over from from scratch because I don't I didn't like the 10 or 15 pages. I'm just not happy with it. But I need to start over. So I just kind of go back and re rewrite it, start from from the beginning. Still the same story, just told differently. Right. Um, but I, I think. Uh, you know, if you can find that window and shoot for that, that goal, and if you go beyond that, that is a bonus for you, right? Um, that, that's really a bonus to go beyond. That's the way I look at it, because that becomes, um, it becomes so doable for me. Uh, I, I, yeah, I do have kids and, and, you know, and I teach, um, uh, as you do, Tony. And so we, you know, we, we have to, um, I don't know about you. I don't. I don't have a whole lot of hobbies. Um, you know, I, I don't really do much, and I know nobody has, right? With the, uh, this pandemic, but um, you know, use that to your benefit. If you don't, uh, it, but I mean, I still allow myself to to you know to talk to friends and and, and things. But uh, I, you know, I I just think it's it comes down to if you're serious about the about the work. And if you're serious about wanting to um, to write, then um, you know, then you it's just a matter of sitting down and, and opening up, opening up the computer, laptop, or whatever, pulling up the document and doing it, and, and closing the other the other stuff out. I think when I find that I that I'm blocked or feeling like uh, I don't know, that's when I pick up something that I love, a writer that I love, or I'll find online a story, you know, um, someone, Zadie Smith, for example, you know, I, I like a lot of Zadie Smith stuff and I might find something by her. And, and then I, I, you know, 
um, read uh, a story by her or something, and then some that just magically, right? It 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 helps you, not just inspires you, right? But it gets you into thinking about reading as a writer and thinking about craft, and and so. Um, I also find when I, I'm blocked, when I feel like I can't get anything done, is when I'm putting too much pressure on myself and thinking this has to be perfect and not allowing myself to, to say, you know what, I'm going to go back and rewrite this 50 times probably, right? I mean, in a short story, if you've got a, let's say you have a 15 page short story that, that you've drafted out, um, you know, that's really the, the point of workshop is to bring it in and it, it's rough. Um, there's always that expectation that um, people are gonna love this, right? And, and um, but, but look at the, the workshop as an opportunity to really listen to your peers and, and, and think, okay, everybody's saying this is what they want more of, but you really need to take this advice, right? And, um, I mean, I, th I think uh, that was helpful for me, um, you know, when, I'm, when I was thinking about my, my writing workshops um, and, and allowing yourself, again, for me, allowing myself to know this is not the final draft. I'm going to draft this out and it, it's gonna be as messy and rough as it can be. You know, and I always mention the um, Don DeLillo the writer, uh, I love Don DeLillo's stuff. He, in, in his novel, Mao Tu, um, there's a, it's about a writer and he uses the metaphor of writing, like taking care of a baby. And in other words, that you first, a, a newborn baby is not able to sort of take care of themselves, right? The, the baby is messy and you have to clean up the baby. You have to feed the baby. You have to dress the baby and take care of it. But pretty soon that baby grows and develops into this beautiful person that is able to talk, to walk around, to communicate, to smile and laugh. And, and, and that's a big part of your comfort. You're taking care of that. And he uses that metaphor that the early stages of, of the novel or of the story are like that, that messy and 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 that that um, you know difficult that you, the the more the more care you put into your work, eventually it will form into this beautiful thing. I think that's such a great metaphor that he uses. Yeah. That's a long. I, again, I'm 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 really talkative. I, I think it's the coffee. I had like <laughs> you know two two cups of coffee um, a little while ago, so that probably. Oh, it's going. good. It's good. I had late afternoon coffee too. So um, we'll, be, we'll be well caffeinated for the conversation. I like that analogy about the baby. It reminds me though of a question that I did have about the book that is maybe not as um, literary or serious a question, but I just really wondered what was up with that, the fowl, um, the bird that follows Edgar in his in his actuality, it seems like, in his imagination too. I'm really, when you mentioned taking care of the baby, I thought, oh yeah, I have to ask him about the fowl. We talked about this in class um, a little too. But anyway, how did how did you come up with, with that character? I mean, it feels like the fowl is a legitimate character. How did you come up with that? The fowl, so I ended up right later adding in the fowl. I, I wanted, I knew, I, I, part of it was, I, need, I wanted a, uh, this obvious metaphor for, a, for his addiction. Right, that's something that's following around, following him around, and um, you know, I, I know that people are always using metaphors. To, people who, at least the the people I know or I've talked to, are often using these metaphors all the time. That when they've talked about their addictions, um, whether that's alcohol or or drugs or gambling, whatever the the addiction is, they've often, you know. Uh, used metaphors and and you know the the kind of standard one is the you know the the bird on the on on your shoulder right and on, on but and so that that's part of what came out of that but also because this book is so focused on language and word specific words um 
the the word foul has in its consonants it's um it's more cryptic sounding i guess than if i would have used blue jay or cardinal or um you know dove or something i mean foul just kind of has a dirtier uh you know like grackle you know it's we think of grackles in there you know crow um you know uh, chicken they these are words that often poets, I've heard poets talk about this, I think is where I've learned this, is poets talking about the specific word choice and how their, how their um, vowels and consonants often will give a certain impression. And so that was part of it. Uh, I, and I knew, I thought, well, as absurd as Edgar's sections are gonna be anyway, um, this will sort of add to the absurdity uh, with, the, with the vowel. Um, his addiction follows him even into the darkening land, right? Um, until he can get out. And so, so that's where that all came from. It's really fascinating. It does really add that layer of the surreal or the strange um, to Edgar to have this, this thing, this bird following him around, it's, it was, it's a really interesting choice. And it, it made me think of the 60s and the 70s, something about that choice alone. So I think what you've done is really, really quite well, something there. And, and, and I should add one more thing that, um, that Edgar's sections were inspired by a Polish writer named Konvinsky, Konvinsky, Konvitsky, Konvitsky, sorry, Polish, spelled K-O-N-W, I C K Y, I think. Um, a dream book for our time is the book. And and in that book, it's a Polish post-World War II novel. I've always loved it. Um, a dream book for our time. Uh, if you can find a copy um, and you like sort of surreal novels, Konvitsky's novel is that. And it's basically about a, a character who comes out of a coma and goes out into the, this very sort of surreal poisoning land, right? And, and so, so some of that was, you know, sort of, I would say probably inspired by Kambitsky. That's interesting, thank you. Mm. Well, I told people if they wanted to ask a couple questions in the chat, we probably have time for just a few of those. Um, Lexi has a good question. She says, we've talked in class some about writing about things we find ourselves fascinated or obsessed with. That's my class. I always make them talk about what they're obsessed with. Uh, for me, I feel like I can get stuck on that part without knowing how to turn it into a plot. Yes. I wonder if you could talk about any process you might have for outlining or planning, things like that. I don't, I'm not really an outliner. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, 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 I think, but some people are. I've, I have friends who can't focus at all unless they have an outline for a story or, or a novel. But I, I'm not an outline because I think that part of the discovery process in writing, doors will open and things will, for me, that's one of the joys of the novel is, I'm probably gonna be working on this for a couple of years, this novel um, or a year or however long. Um, and, things will change. And, and I, I found that, that if I think it's going somewhere and I plan on it, it often ends up taking a different direction. And I think that's a good thing. Now, a good editor will help you, right, structure, a, a good workshop will help you, right? Your peers, I think, can help you. And so use, use your workshop for that. If you don't know, and you think this is, this is the novel that I want to write. This is, and this is how we help other, each other um, to sit down in those workshops or those long dinners or coffee or late at night and talk about each other's work. Um, and, and shooting those ideas off of one, one another. Right, but I, I, uh, I find that when I'm not writing it, I'm usually thinking about it and something will happen. I, I'll see an opportunity 
for opportunities. Um, that, that's just what works best for me. Um, and the case in point is, so I'm writing for the first time, um, I'm writing a middle grade book, which I've never, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually have, I've written a children's book before and it's awful, right? I wrote it like 20 years ago, it's terrible. Um, but uh, I mean, I hope I'm not saying about that about my work now, 20 years from now, right? But I'm writing this middle grade book. And here's the thing is um, we sold it, my agent sold it, and I haven't written it yet. Uh, so I had to write a, uh, this is rare in fiction, but I mean, so, you know, you always have to write something for fiction, but I, my agent uh, did me a really good uh, deal here. But um, so I was able to sell it before it's written. I had like two chapters and an outline. That's all he said, that's all you need. Two chapters and an outline. I thought, okay, I can do that. And so I wrote these two chapters and an outline. I have started writing it since and it's nothing like the two chapters whatsoever. It's not like it, it's, it's totally different, nothing. And so I wrote to the editor and I was like, yeah, there might be some different things. And he's like, oh, that's fine, I trust you, right? Um, so that's the problem for me with an outline is if I stuck with that, I had, two chapters and I just don't like them. And I feel like, you know, this is not the direction I, I wanna go. So I feel like it, it sort of holds me down a little bit. But again, other people, other people work very well with them. So I think whatever you feel, um, you know, there's, that's the thing about this, you know, writing is there's no exact way um, to do it. We can just sort of offer what works for us and what doesn't work for us. Yeah, that's really good advice. And I'm glad there'll be a middle grade novel too. That's good to know about. That's exciting. Yeah, what I, I, I yeah, I mean, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> I hope so, so. Well, Eden in the chat is wondering about the specific acronyms and details in the section you read today about the game. How much research do you typically do for your novels and what form does that research take? Um, good question. Um, I think with, with Edgar's sections, uh, in the game, I looked up gaming manuals and, you know, looked up, you know, the bonus and rewards and game objective age, all, all that. I just went online and just read different gaming manuals for that. Actually, the manual was much longer and my editor was like, ugh, you know, nobody wants to read a you know five pages uh, six pages of your game manual right let's get it down to can you get down to one or two pages tops and so i i i did scale it back a little bit it's you know but um uh part of that was it was it was fun it was a lot of fun to write that that game manual because it was a completely fictional game right um so i you know i just do whatever research i can um uh, which generally involves reading some kind of, you know, some, and I have, we have a house full of books here all, all around. So there's something, you know, that, um, that I'll be able to find, or I'll be able to find it online, um, you know, through the, through, through the library. Um, but I think that's important. If you're writing something that you don't know much about, I found that going and doing the research and printing out or writing down as many different, you know, specific details about that as you can first, because that kind of stuff can come out in your character's dialogue or, or you know, um, or in whatever ways, um, you know, so I, um, the acronyms and so forth were just kind of playful, right? Um, you know, for, for, for this, which is, uh, which, which was fun. Thomas Pynchon, um, you know, does that a lot um, in, a, in a, lot of, a lot of his work is he has acronyms throughout. Um, and, and I always thought he was a fun writer. He's somebody that as brilliant and, and difficult as his books are, I also think they're fun, you know, and, and you can tell he, he has, you know, some little, you know, winks and, and nudges, you know, sometimes. So 
um, I, I encourage you to try to find as much pleasure in whatever you're working on as you can. Uh, because then the writing feels very exciting to you as the writer and and you know um who you know wh wh whatever you're working on um, try to find that pleasure in it once it once it feels dead on the page it's hard you can't apply cpr to it it's it's really hard to bring it back to life it's just dead and then you have to um just you know uh usually just trash it or i do anyway so yeah i think sometimes you can resuscitate through editing but mostly mostly not mostly it's a big dnr on those sections i agree okay hannah is asking um she's about to graduate in december and wants to find a job in a creative writing field uh what did you do she's asking after college while oh. writing okay um, sorry, I I don't know. Everybody froze, but I don't know if that's my internet. Did I freeze? I think I froze and you froze. I don't know about everybody else. Okay. <laughs> I was I, watching okay. you both froze. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. A collective internet glitch there, I think. Cross time yeah. space. Um, yeah. Well, Hannah's, Hannah's graduating in December and wants to find a job in the creative writing field, but doesn't think that's stable, probably or realistic right out of college. And so she's asking, what did you do after college while you were writing? which is a really good question, I think. I did a little bit of teaching um, and I was miserable at that um, because I you know, I had some high school and middle school teaching and I just didn't like, I'm not very good at it. Um, but I, I, and then I, I did seven years, I did, I worked in social work, um, which I did mostly enjoy. Um, yeah, it's difficult work, you know, but, but it was very helpful because um, I, I got, you know, a lot of my material um, came out of that. So I think there's a lot to be said about, um, you know, if, if I wanted to write something about, um, you know, an, an attorney, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about, you know, I don't know anything about law. I would really have to do a ton of research to, you know, to, um, you know, to, to write about someone in law school and what they're studying, if that was part of what I'm writing. Um, but I think, it's, there's a lot to be said about going out and doing other types of work and using that knowledge in your fiction. The biggest problem for me was in, in Oklahoma was I was doing social work and I didn't have a community of, of writers around me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't have anybody. I could go meet at the coffee shop at 10 o'clock on a Friday night and say, Let's let's sit here and talk for a while, and, and you know, and exchange work with. I, 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 the town I was living in was just not. Um, it was me, and and I really, really missed that community. And so I went back and got, got my PhD, and it was like, oh my gosh, this is this is where I'm supposed to be. This you know, among this community and these people who are just like me. You know, we love writing and and reading, um, and talking about about this stuff. Um, but I, if you could have the best of both worlds, right? Um, if you, I mean, the, the, the easy answer is you, you could get a teaching job somewhere, if, if, but you know, um, I, I don't know about anybody else. You, I'm, I'm not enough of a, the problem is I'm not enough of a disciplinarian to, to teach, um, which I found out the hard way, right? Going in the classroom and, you know, having to, I don't have the energy. <laughs> I don't have the energy for you know to 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 deal with to deal with the, the problems there. Um, so I'm not very good at it. Um, so, but but somebody else may be. I don't know. I I never really taught seniors. I would think that seeing juniors or seniors in high school may be a little bit different. I don't know. You, they they're mature enough to where, you know, um, the only problems is maybe keeping them from falling asleep or something I don't know but I mean um, the younger ones that I've I've taught you know seventh and up have just been a nightmare <laughs> yeah no I think getting a job that has interesting material or you learn about something interesting is good advice too you know that's yeah. 
that's good if I, I'm not talking anybody into going to teaching middle school from from this speech I can tell but I mean um, you know I it, yeah I think finding finding something that and and keeping track of all the specific details that people don't know about that job you know is is it's it's good advice but also there are a lot of jobs in there I, you know this Tony there's so many jobs in publishing. I had no idea like how many editors there are because it's not just your, which I mean, edit, that's a, you know, certainly with the, there, there are a lot of editing jobs of people with creative writing degrees. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, David uh, uh, Levithan who wrote the Lillian Dash Netflix series um, based on his middle grade novels, he and and he wrote um, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which is a YA book. It's a very successful um, young adult middle grade writer. Is also an editor at Scholastic, and so he he does both. And so I think you know if that's something you're interested in going in. I mean, I, I you know I had a copy editor look at my stuff, and then my editor, and then there was an assistant editor. There's just so many editors. Right. And, and that go through um, that, I think, you know, they, they're looking for people with certainly with MFAs and, and, you know, who know how story works, you know, and know good writing. And, and, and that's everybody here. Right. Um, and so, uh, so that's something to think of too. Also, literary agencies, you know, is, is also, I know that's a little bit, that's, I mean, that's still, agents also are editors, you know, I mean, my agent, you know, well, my experience with my agent, I mean, I have a new agent now, my old age, agent, I mean, was going through my manuscript, like three drafts after I thought this is, this is revised and this is good. And then my agent was like three drafts and then, and then we'll go out and sell it. Right. So, I mean, that, there are a lot of literary agencies that they're looking for people who know story and know good writing and can talk about it. Right. This is what, this is what makes a good novel. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that that's good advice. Thank you. Well, I think we're sure. about at the end of our time. Lee, is that right? About eight o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you all yeah. of you for your good questions um, to everyone who posted a question. And Lee, do you well, have any final words or Jane? Yeah, um, on the on behalf of the University of Arkansas MFA program in creative writing and translation, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. Brandon, thank you so much for your terrific reading and conversation and uh, solid advice <laughs> on writing. Um, uh, Professor Tony Vincent, thank you for leading the conversation. Andrea Rogers, we appreciate your um, excellent introduction. Um, it's great to see everyone. Leah Frieden at the uh, Fayetteville Public Library, thanks for making this all happen. I'm glad we could all be together tonight. Thank you all. Wado to, to everyone. And um, uh, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity. I look forward to talking to the students one on one uh, in a couple of weeks. Yep. So, yeah. so thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.